Hello friends, welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis um, dated 24th April 2018. Uh, the first uh, topic of the day is the APSPA, that is Armed Forces Special Powers Act. This has been lifted in Meghalaya uh, on Sunday, uh, a notification was issued. So the centre has lifted this, you know, uh, draconian law. It was effective in the state of uh, in the 20 kilometer area uh, which borders Assam. So in Arunachal Pradesh as well, the AFSPA has been restricted to just eight police stations, which was earlier 16 police stations. The official uh, decision was taken in the wake of a significant improvement in the security situation in the state. So except for Tripura and Manipur, the center was issuing such in, in notifications for Assam. Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, and Meghalaya. So, in cases of uh, Tripura and Manipur, there were no notifications issued. Why? Because it was applied for the entire state. <coughs> so, what is this APSPA all about? So, these are the acts of the Parliament of India uh, that grant special powers to the armed forces and uh, the state and the paramilitary forces in the areas classified as disturbed areas. We are going to see what disturbed areas are and uh, who has the power to declare disturbed areas. It gives the powers to the army, state and the central police forces uh, to shoot to kill such houses, destroy any property which might be used by the insurgents in these areas uh, you know, uh, for uh, creating unrest. So what are the provisions? So as per is invoked when a case of militancy or insurgency takes place and uh, the territorial integrity of the nation is uh, threatened. So what are the salient features of APSPA? So the government of the state or the central government uh, are the ones which are empowered to declare uh, partially or the complete state as a disturbed area. If according to their opinion, mark the word opinion, that it has become necessary to dis, uh, disrupt uh, the terrorist activity or any such activity that might impinge on the sovereignty of India or cause insult to national flag, anthem or India's constitution. So, the reasons can be that of sovereignty of India or the national symbols of, um, being insulted. So the section 3 of the APSPA provides that if the governor of the state issues an official notification in the Gazette of India, then the central government has the authority to deploy armed forces for assisting the civilian authorities. Once a region is declared disturbed, then it has to maintain the status quo for a minimum of three months. So first the governor of the state you know, makes a recommendation and uh, the central government, if it accepts, it is going to deploy the armed forces and this continues in a region which has been declared disturbed area for at least three months. The section four gives special powers to the army forces, uh, army officers. So it can kill, shoot and kill any individual who violates the law or is suspected to violate the law. So this includes assembly of uh, five or more people, uh, of her carrying weapons. The only condition is that the officer has to give a warning before opening the fire. Also, the security forces can arrest anybody without a warrant. They can search the houses without consent. Once person is taken into custody, uh, he has to be handed over to the nearest police station as soon as possible. The prosecution of the officer on duty for alleged violation of human rights requires prior permission of the central government. So this is what makes uh, the entire law rather draconian, where accountability cannot be fixed so easily on the officers who might get involved in killing of, you know, the people who are suspected to be involved in the insurgency activities. Section 3 of the ASPA uh, is more important. Why? Because this is the one which declares the disturbed areas. So the power to, you know, declare disturbed areas is conferred on the governor of the state or the administrator of the union territory or the central government. The entire or a part of it can be declared disturbed area as we have seen earlier. 
The state government can suggest whether the act is required to be enforced or not, but under Section 3, the opinion can be overruled by the governor of the state or by the center. Initially, when the act came into force in 1958, the power to confer ASPA was uh, given only to the uh, governor of the state. This power was uh, extended to the central government with an amendment in 1978. The Act does not explicitly explain under what circumstances one can declare an area as disturbed area. It only states that as per requires that such an authority be of the opinion that the whole or part of the area is in a dangerous or in the disturbed condition, such that the use of armed forces uh, is, necessity, is a necessity uh, to aid the civil powers. The next topic is that related to section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. Why was it in news? So the Supreme Court on Monday uh, asked the government to respond to a plea by a hotelier to strike down the colonial section 377 of the Indian Penal Code which criminalizes homosexuality. Uh, it seeks the right to choice of sexual orientation uh, to be declared as a part of uh, the article 21 of the constitution uh, which gives uh, which states that you know it's a fundamental right to life and personal liberty every citizen has a fundamental right to life and personal liberty so it's not like it is the first time section 377 has come into question earlier the supreme court had uh, taken a stance and now it has changed the stance so on January 8th of this year, the Supreme Court decided that it is going to review its uh, December 2013 verdict uh, in a famous case called the Suresh Kumar Kaushal vs. Nas Foundation. Uh, it dismissed the LGBT community as a negligible part of the population uh, while virtually denying them the right to choice and sexual orientation. The Supreme Court had uh, said a section of people cannot leave uh, now, it has said that a section of society cannot be living in a fear of law which atrophies or deteriorates their right to choice and natural sexual inclinations. It did say that societal morality changes with time and the law should change as well. Adding that, uh, the concept of consensual sex may require more protection. What is the section 377 which is making so much in a, of noise uh, deal with? It's a colonial law, by the way. Unnatural offenses, it deals with unnatural offenses. It reads, whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman or animal shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So it says carnal intercourse which you know carnal intercourse against the order of nature. What is this order of nature? So the SE has now said that the determination of order of nature is not a common phenomenon. Individual autonomy and individual natural inclinations should be uh, given more you know emphasis it cannot be that is the natural inclinations of individuals or individual autonomy cannot be atrophied, uh, atrophied that is deteriorated or you know wasted away, unless the restrictions are determined as reasonable. It has further observed that what is natural for one may not be natural for the other, but the confines of the law cannot be trampled or curtailed, uh, you know based on the inherent rights embedded with an individual under the article 21. The next topic, it's an opinion piece. Uh, the other opinion pieces are of not much importance today. Why? Because they are related to uh, politics. Uh, they are not important. The important one is the risk in fracking. You know, it's a technology uh, used to uh, you know, mine out the shale reserves so many scholars believe that the fossil fuel energy will decline markedly by 2050. However, now it has been challenged by some of the scholars saying that these resources can last for centuries to come. 
to amongst other energy supplies which are going to last for centuries to come is the shale gas and oil which are available in abundance so shale availability and the fracking process how where is shale available in india uh, and uh, where in earth is shale available and uh, what is this fracking process all about what are the you know, benefits and uh, what are the you know negative impacts shale might have or the fracking process might have so shale gas and oil or unconventional natural resources uh, we have found below the depths of 2500 to 5000 5, meters as compared to the conventional crude which is available at 1500 meters so in india the shale glass uh, sorry the shale gas blocks are identified in Andhra Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Gujarat, Rajasthan, and Tamil Nadu. The process of extracting shale, oil, and gas requires deep vertical drilling followed by horizontal drilling. So it's called hydraulic fracturing or fracking, where high volumes are mixed with certain chemicals and are pushed down to break the rocks and released. Uh, and uh, you know this releases trapped minerals. There are economic and political benefits which accrue from uh, the shale you know, extraction. Because of its benefits, shale gas is being pursued by some as a savior of humanity in the coming years. Uh, it appears to be an attractive tool that is fracking, both politically and economically. To gain such benefits, the government introduced policy on shale gas and oil in 2013, permitting national oil companies to engage in fracking. However, the environmental groups have strongly criticized this move. Uh, we see that uh, it will have an adverse impact on the environment. Uh, even the countries like Germany and France and uh, you know, subnational governments like Scotland have banned fracking. What are the negative effects uh, when it comes to fracking? It uh, consumes large amounts of water. Uh, we are also case already, water case already. And uh, relatively, uh, it uses large surface area. Uh, it is bound to impact our irrigation systems and uh, it would impact the local requirements. In the US experience, chemical substances uh, have been identified to pose a risk to human life and environment. They contain carcinogens and they also contain chemicals which uh, are toxic to the freshwater organisms. 25 to 90 percent of the fuel is not retrieved. That is, it's not. Uh, it cannot be taken back, and the cracks in the shaft uh, are possible, and uh, this poses a high risk uh, uh, to the pollution, or so as to say, high risk of pollution to the nearby underground water. Fracking has other impacts, such as increased air emissions. It includes greenhouse gases and it can also lead to seismic activity, that is, earthquake-like activities. The entire policy uh, uh, which has been implemented in India can face legal hurdles as well. The Supreme Court has ruled that every person has a right to enjoy pollution-free water and the air. So, this is under Article 21. It is also an established principle that the state holds its natural resources interest for the benefit of people and has the duty to protect these resources from harm. If the risk from fracking to underground water materializes, goods can hold the state responsible for it, stop the activity and order other corrective and preventive measures. So this is the conclusion part. So that's it for today folks and uh, we'll come up with uh, you know, the other articles for tomorrow. Meet you soon. Thank you.